per minute. But now the speed or the rate of compression that is recommended is faster than the ones we've had in previous guidelines. So compression rates of at least 100 per minute is what uh, we want. Then you should allow for complete chest record. That means during chest compression, when you place your hand there, you lean your whole weight on it. And then during recoil, you release your weight without lifting your hand. And recoil occurs naturally. It's good that you allow for recoil. Because it is during recoil that the heart can refill. So if you compromise recoil, you're going to be delivering CPR that is less than high quality. Okay? And then that may affect the outcome. And another one is to minimize interruption in chest compression. Now, there are two major tasks you perform during your CPR. The first task is your chest compressions. The second task is your ventilation. Now, that's what we call compression ventilation ratio. That means how many compressions do you want to give before you pause to give how many breaths or how many ventilation. Okay. Now, for an adult patient, for example, we still talk about compression ventilation ratio shortly. But when you've delivered your set of 30 compressions, and then you are waiting to deliver your set of two breaths, now the time interval between the 30th compression of the last cycle and the first compression of the new cycle, after you give me two breaths, that is regarded as interruption. So how long should it be? It must be less than 10 seconds. I will explain uh, a little why, why that has to be so. But try and minimize interruption to less than 10 seconds during CPR. Okay? And then avoid excessive ventilation during your CPR. Now, those are the quality criteria. Now, why do we have to minimize interruption to less than 10 seconds? Now, as you can see in this diagram, this represents a set of 30 compressions, two breaths. 30 compressions, two breaths. I will introduce you to a concept that is called CPP, coronary perfusion pressure. Now, that is the pressure that should be in coronary artery to enable it to deliver blood to the myocyte. During cardiac arrest, CPP comes down to zero. No pressure in the coronary vessel, no blood supply to the heart. When you start doing your CPR, that will increase the CPP, the pressure in the coronary vessel, to the CPP level, which is the coronary perfusion pressure. But you will not get to the CPP level until the first few compressions. So maybe it's the 8, 9, 10 compressions that we get into that. Then after 30 compressions, you see stop CPP comes back to zero again. So because of that fluctuations, we don't want too long interruption between chest compressions, okay, so that blood, the myocyte can get constant supply of blood. Now, what are the compression ventilation ratios when we are doing CPR? This will actually depend on the age of the patient on one hand, and number two, they depend on the number of rescuers that are carrying out the CPR. For example, if your patient is an adult, and you are the only one who is doing the CPR, your compression ventilation ratio will be 30 to 2. Okay? If your patient is still an adult patient and an extra pair of competent hands joins you, it will still be, your compression ventilation ratio will still remain 30 to 2. So that means for an adult patient or victim, irrespective of the number of rescuers, the compression ventilation ratio is always 30 to 2. Okay, what if the patient was a child and then you are a lone rescuer? So you are still going to be using compression ventilation ratio 30 to 2. But now, if you have an extra pair of hands joining you, and then there are two of you now having to do the CPR for a child patient, your compression ventilation ratio will change to 15 to 2. 
So you're not, you're not going to be using ratio 30 to 2 anymore, but you're going to be using compression ventilation ratio 15 to 2. If your patient was an infant and then you are alone, you're still going to use compression ventilation ratio 30 to 2. But if there are more than one person there, you're going to be using 15 to 2. Now, of all this scenario and age group, you will observe that compression ventilation ratio 30 to 2 has fissured more. And that is why we call that universal compression ventilation ratio because that is what you use as a lone rescuer irrespective of the age of the patient. Please note that we've excluded uh, neonatal resuscitation from this program. We cover that under another curriculum. So when we say victim of all ages, we only mean adult, child, and infant patient. Okay. Now, sometimes you may want to do, as healthcare professional, you may want to do CPR in the setting of an advanced airway. Then your compression ventilation ratio 30 to 2 will no longer hold. So we don't want you to think that, irrespective of the scenario or the airway me method, is always ratio 30 to 2. If, for example, your patient has an endotracheal tube in place at the time of cardiac arrest, or as a laryngeal mask airway, or as a combi tube, or as a laryngeal tube. Now, these are all advanced airway uh, equipment. Now, in the presence of any of them, when they are in place, you will not do CPR at 30 to 2 anymore. You are going to be doing this. Compression will continue at an uninterrupted rate of at least 100 per minute. Then, ventilation will also continue at an uninterrupted rate of one breath every six to eight seconds and both will not wait for each other so compression will not have to stop for ventilation so the rescuer that is giving breath be delivering one breath every six to eight seconds the rescuer that is giving chest compression will just continue to give compression at the rate of at least 100 per minute without stopping at all so that is how we do cpr in the setting of advanced airway. Okay, early defibrillation. How do we shock the patient and what is the importance? The most prevalent electrical activity in the immediate period following sudden cardiac arrest are the shockable rhythms. Actually, if a patient is in cardiac arrest, you know, cardiac arrest like junior brother of death, so sometimes we say it's potentially reversible death, okay? There are four fatal arrhythmias that a patient in cardiac arrest can show. But you can only show one of them per given time. The four are, number one, ventricular fibrillation. Number two, pulseless ventricular tachycardia. Number three, pulseless electrical activity. And number four, asystole. Now, the first two I've mentioned, which are ventricular fibrillation and pulseless ventricular tachycardia, they are called shockable rhythm. The second, or uh, the, the second two, which are number three and four, that means pulseless electrical activity and asystole, they are called non shockable rhythm. The beautiful thing God has done is that in the immediate period following cardiac arrest, the most prevalent arrhythmias are ventricular fibrillation and pulseless ventricular tachycardia. Both of them are uh, shockable. Okay, but again, the chance of successful defibrillation will wane rapidly with the passage of time. So that means that we can have a patient starting with ventricular fibrillation now. If you cannot defibrillate using an AED or a manual defibrillator immediately, with the passage of time, that patient will no longer respond to defibrillation. Okay, so time again is more to hear. We cannot overemphasize that. Now, for patients who may have ventricular fibrillation cardiac arrest, three important phases have been identified to show the trend or to show the way they behave before they eventually decay into asystole, which is not shockable. So in the immediate period, 
of the cardiac arrest, the VF cardiac arrest, that means ventricular fibrillation cardiac arrest. What you have is what we call the electrical phase of the cardiac arrest. Now, in the electrical phase, a patient that is having VF in the electrical phase will respond well to electric shock because at that time there is still a lot of energy, ATP is in the myocyte. At that time, the damage to the myocyte is very, very minimal. Okay? Now, if you pass that stage without shocking that patient, the patient will move to the second phase. The second phase, which is called the hemodynamic phase. Now, at hemodynamic phase, we have more extensive damage to the myocyte. Okay? And the chance of successful defibrillation is not as high as you will have had in the electrical phase. The last phase is the metabolic phase, which is the third phase. Now here, there is extensive damage and destruction of the myocyte. And then there is also massive depletion of the uh, ATP storage. Now, if you shock a patient at this stage, the patient may never come back to life again. Okay, because at that point, the patient may now have what we call fine VF. Ventricular fibrillation can be divided into two, depending on the size of the amplitude. We have coarse, we are fine. Now, the coarse one is what you have in the uh, earlier phase. But in the later phase now, the metabolic phase, it probably will have become the fine ventricular fibrillation. Now, this is very similar to asystole. What will simply happen is that once you de defibrillate the patient at this phase, the patient will go into silence, but because there is no ATP anymore, there is no energy to restart the heart from any of the myocytes. So it's going to be silent now and uh, forevermore. Okay, so this graph is trying to show us the chance of survival from sudden cardiac arrest in ventricular fibrillation. Now what we have here is that the chance of successful defibrillation wanes by 10% with the passage of every minute. So what we mean is this, if we have a patient that is having ventricular fibrillation and you shock him in the first minute of it, you will have close to 100% of them coming back to life. If you wait until the second minute, you will have like 80% of them coming back to life. If you wait until the fifth minute, you will have like 50% of them coming back. By, at the end of 10 minutes, you will hardly have any of them coming back to life. Okay, so we cannot overemphasize that. Now, a system that will respond and that is capable of delivering shock to ventricular fibrillation um, uh, in 10 minutes is, 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 is one of the promises of the chain of survival that we've discussed. Okay, now in that graph, in this same graph that we've seen, what if somebody has been around providing chest compression for this patient? Are we going to have any difference in this? Yes. So chest compression keeps sending more blood to the heart so that there can be enough energy supply to the myocyte and that is going to preserve the shockability of the shockable rhythm. So what we mean is, this, let's illustrate it more practically. If we have two patients, let's say patient A and patient B, and then both of them have cardiac arrest, sudden cardiac arrest, and the rhythm the, the two of them have to start with is ventricular fibrillation, shockable rhythm. And we sent for AED for the two of them. But patient A was lucky enough to have somebody who started doing chest compression from the moment it collapsed. There was nobody to provide chest compression for patient B. But the AED for the two of them arrives at the fifth minute. Now, for patient B, who has not received chest compression from the time of collapse, the chance of success, successful defibrillating him will now be 50% because we've shown that the chance declines by 10% with the passage of every minute in the absence of bystander CPR. But for patient A who has been receiving 
bystander CPR, the chance of successful uh, defibrillation will not have waned that rapidly. The decline in, in defibrillation.